So the last of these areas or dimensions of disruption that I talked about, we talked about customers, we've talked about offerings, is really about routes to market. And you better believe, as I said before, you know, you can get the offerings right, you can get, you know, the focus on the customers right, but if you mess up on your routes to market, you're sunk. Okay, and there are some serious changes happening in this space. I'll just wind up really with two, okay, and, but they're big ones. One is just in the channel. Now, Janet Waxman, who many of you may know, and Stephen Graham, they're going to be speaking later about these disruptions in the channel. But if you think back to that discussion we had about community, you know, about the uh, software platforms moving online with software as a service and services vendors moving online and these big communities, that's going to disrupt the channel in a big way. Some people have thought, well, okay, the OEMs, and this means the big vendors who push their products through the channel, so SAP and IBM and Microsoft and Oracle, the fact that they're going online, some people read that and say, well, if they're going direct to the customer and online, doesn't that get rid of the need for the channel? We don't need them. The channel's dead. In fact, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. These new platforms, these new online hubs, are really the new foundation for channel enablement, the new channel. And in fact, the worst thing that could happen for a channel player is to do work with a vendor, work with a major vendor who is not moving online and not moving direct. That's the worst thing that could happen to them. Because the OEMs will need the channel. But they're not going to need the old channel. They're going to need channel players who've really redesigned who they are for this new online world and they, that they've built new value uh, in several ways. One, that they have become some of these people who make sense out of the chaos of all these online applications and micro-solutions and services that are online and are able to assemble that for you know, even the smallest of customers. Think of this as systems integration for the masses. Okay, they're going to have access to this big online toolkit of solutions, courtesy of the large uh, online hubs. The other thing they're going to do is the new channel players, like the big services vendors, are going to turn some of their know-how about customers into code. They're going to contribute code. They're going to create software and some of their own solutions so they can get broader distribution and broader leverage. But the most important thing is their value to customers in both integration in this new model and in delivering some of their expertise as software is going to be tied to how expert are they on knowing certain micro segments of customers, whether that's by industry, sub-industry, geography, language, process, sub-process, or any combination of all of the above. That's where their expertise is going to be, and that's where their value is going to be. So when you put that together, the balance of power will certainly shift, but not in the way people think. This online world is not going to shift power away from the channel. It's going to shift power to the channel. So that's one side. The second and last of these route-to-market disruptions really closes the circle for us where we started. Remember we talked about the line of business executive and really the small and medium business person who they want business outcomes. You know, they want business value, business results. As people would say, you know, they want holes, not drills. You know, the technology is the drill. What they want at the end of the day is that hole. And so, in fact, when you think back to what John Gans talked about earlier, Remember, he said, really, the opportunity before us is much larger than the traditional IT market or even the BPO services as they are today. The real opportunity is that $15 trillion of internal process spend within the enterprise where you know, no vendor, business service or IT vendor, has come and given a good enough service that would cause the customer to shift some of that spending outside. So there is a huge opportunity for us to put IT and deliver IT to the market, if you will, in, in business service clothing. For us to work with business service providers like you know, F, uh, FedEx and DHL and Hewitt and Convergis and marketing services and even the Time Warners and the Walt Disneys, and as well, David brought up the new generation of service providers, the Amazons and the, and the Ebays, all of these guys, to create this new generation of business services, many of which will be online in terms of their delivery. There's a great opportunity, but it's going to force two very unnatural acts for IT players. We're going to have to be willing to deliver our IT under the covers of some of these business service vendors' brands and maybe hide our own brand. Now, for those of us who've developed very strong brands and who have very strong customer relationships, this is very uh, unpleasant, a very unpleasant thought. 
the idea that your brand may not even show up under you know, your business service OEM. And yet I was interested, the CEO of uh, Intuit um, recently was asked, you know, they just spent $1.3 billion on an online banking software vendor called Digital Insight, that they're going to sell that, those software, that software platform to banks as the basis of the bank's offerings to their customers. And so he was asked, well, what, what about the Intuit brand, and how's that all going to work, and the, and the bank's brand? And this is what he said. He said, the banks will brand it however they want to brand it. It could be powered by QuickBooks. It could be, but it, it, it doesn't have to be. We don't care. We're flexible on how they use the brand. You know, can you think about your own company? Can you imagine your senior executives, particularly your marketing executives, saying the same thing? So are we willing to do this? Not as the entire offering, but as part of our portfolio. Some will be buried. Some will be still direct to customer. And then the second thing that's a little uncomfortable to think about is this whole merging of IT and business services for business outcomes is going to really throw into question who we are, who we are and what our businesses are. And if you think about it, last year I talked about this. I talked about some IT vendors have created BPO or business process outsourcing practices, you know, IBM, EDS, Xerox, others. And so they've made the decision. We're going to be in the IT business, and we are also going to be in the business services area. But let me tell you, this merging that we're seeing right now, it goes way beyond BPO services. It, it, it means that more of you than you think are going to be in the business services business over the next several years than you think right now. And just to think about it, just two examples. You know, when Apple launched the iTunes store, they weren't doing so as a technology vendor. They became a media retailer. And when Microsoft promises to use advertising as more of a funding model for distribution of its software, is that Microsoft coming up with a new pricing model for its software? Or is it Microsoft getting into a business service advertising that happens to be enabled by software? I think these lines are going to be blurring, and, and I think the traditional view is, okay, IT and business clothing, we're going to, you know, that's the new future. We're going to dress business around the core, which is IT. I think that's the wrong perspective. Remember, customers want the business outcome. So instead of IT and business clothing, I think the perspective is probably business services with IT underwear. So, okay, what's our guidance? You put all of these things together. What's our guidance to be successful in this new world of enterprise IT? I think it's simple. We have to think about three things. Customers. You know, are we focused on the new disruptive customers, the traditional ones, absolutely, but also the new disruptive ones, and prioritizing their needs as we think about the marketplace and our are role? Are we willing to take chances to change our uh, offerings and adopt disruptive models in order to be successful in meeting those customers' needs? Are we willing to look at what we need to do to create and participate in these new exploding communities of innovation, to be willing to give up a little bit of control? Because you know what? Single vendors aren't going to control these communities. In order to uh, enlarge the pie, and to quickly create more value and more business relevance for the marketplace. And, of course, are we willing and capable of expanding our R&D radar screen to look at where most of the newer innovations are coming from that will, yeah, it won't be about the consumer only. It will also be, as Danielle said, about the enterprise. And lastly, are we willing to totally rethink our routes to market? So, you know, that's a lot of disruption to digest as we get ready for lunch. No pun intended. But as we do so, and we go through the rest of the day, and we go back to the office and to our colleagues, I would urge us to think about you know, how are our businesses, and yes, I'd say how even our careers, how are we thinking about how we will take advantage of these disruptions in the enterprise marketplace? How will we surf with these disruptions rather than fight against them so that we are, in fact, the disruptors rather than the disrupted?